Hello everyone, welcome to the Tent of Abraham. I'm Tamir Kreisman from Israel, and this is Parashat Behar, on the mountain. Uh, Behar can be found in Leviticus 25, 1 to 26, 2. It is but one chapter and one verse, it's very short. And this one is called Respect. So since this is a relatively short Parsha, and the lessons are very important, I'm going to try and cover most of the overlying theme over here. So let's start from the beginning. <clears throat> Leviticus 25.1 And the Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, saying, Anyone? Do I have a problem with this verse? Do you? What's the difference? What's different about this verse right now from all other verses apart from when Moses really was on Mount Sinai? I mean, there's your answer, right? The question is, why does it mention Mount Sinai when at this very moment, Moses is not up there? He only went up there when God called him. Mount Sinai is a holy mountain. And without a personal invitation, you're not getting in. So I want you to understand something here. The things that we're about to discuss in this week's portion have most likely been given to Moses when he was on the mountain back in the book of Exodus. And before we cover some of the topics in this portion, I want to show you again just how cool God is. The tone is set in the very first verse, in the very first name, in the very name of the parsha itself, on the mountain. Now, once we understand that tone, then we go into this chapter with the right frame of mind. So, let's do it. What is Mount Sinai? Is it a prestigious mountain? Surely it's not the tallest mountain, right? Or the most beautiful. In fact, Mount Sinai was a relatively smaller mountain that did not have any kind of significant or special appearance. And that's exactly why God chose this mountain. This mountain is called the mountain of God. This is the mountain upon which God would descend and give us his eternal word, the Torah. This is the mountain upon which God would bind us to him with an eternal covenant. This is the mountain to which the very first redeemer of Israel was called. Talking about Moses. This is Mount Sinai. Respect. So look what King David wrote in Psalm 68. Now this is relevant to Sinai <coughs> and what will be discussed shortly. Verse 7. God settles the, solita uh, uh, the solitary in his house. He takes the prisoners out, of the most out at the most opportune time. But the rebellious dwell in an arid land. Elohim moshiv yechidim beita, motzi asirim bekosharot ach sorerim shachnu tzchicha. So, who are the prisoners? Who are the prisoners? And when we, don't get, uh, when we don't have God in our lives, we are prisoners still. But the rebellious dwell in an arid land. That's the desert. That's the wilderness. The wilderness is not only solitude, per se. It's not only to be taken in the literal sense. Duality, remember, physical and spiritual. O oh God, when you went out before your people, this is the next verse in Psalm 68, verse 8. O oh God, when you went out before your people, when you marched through the wilderness forever. Elohim betzedcha lifnei amcha betzadcha beisimon selah. Nobody in their right mind would walk into a place that was designed to bring them death, right? This is what the wilderness is, unless God himself is leading the way. So why forever? Because, my friends, this world was the result of death. And it will kill us, spiritually speaking, just like in the physical wilderness. So what do I mean by this? Lack of bread or water. Not just the kind that fills your belly, but the kind that quenches the soul. There are snakes and scorpions walking among us. Yeah, you know who you are. But don't you worry now. We know who you are too. And soon, everyone else is going to know. There are pagan armies and nations that come at us in order to destroy the people of God. 
Look at our history. We got the Greeks, the Babylonians, the Romans, the church, the Ottoman Empire, the Crusades, the pogroms, the inquisitions, the Nazis, Islam, anti-Semitism, you name it. We've been through it. We're going through it. But in the end, it doesn't really matter. Because, next verse, the earth quaked, even the heavens dripped. This is Sinai because of God, the God of Israel. God did not choose Sinai because it was mighty, but because it was the least of all the mountains. God did not choose Israel because they were mighty, but because we were the lowest of the low, stiff-necked people. God speaks to us through his creation, through King David. Listen to the understanding of this man, David. Next verse. Generous rain you poured down, O God. Your heritage, which was weary, you established. What is rain, if not life from the heavens, that sustains the whole earth and its inhabitants? Which are all gods, right? We've, we've established that. But in this context, what came from the heavens? if not the Torah. Your heritage? That's Jacob, which was, re- which was weary. And guess what? We still are weary. You established. You. Now get this. I want you to either flip your brain upside down or give me a new, give me, uh, get with me right here. And I'm going to try and give you a new perspective. Or you could just turn your brain off entirely, clear your mind, and listen to what I'm about to share. King David was called the man after God's own heart. Correct? We know this. Now, even though, yes, he sinned, but it's not about the sin. Everyone sins. We are in the world of sin. It's about the tshuva, which is, this is why he was man after God's own heart. No one outpraised David. We discussed this as well. He was the spiritual godfather of soul. No disrespect to James Brown. Wow. So anyway, The righteous and the wicked. They could be the same person. They definitely start from the same place. There's no such thing as privilege when it comes to God. Many Gentiles say to me, you're so fortunate that you're a Jew. I get this a lot, to which I respond, and you all know this, but you're even more fortunate because I was born a Jew, but you can choose to be a Jew. And if you become a Jew, that means that you always were a Jew. We each have our own path, but we all have to drink the water from the same source. So when God gave us the Torah, it was like generous rain, right? Pouring down and giving life to the world. But many people, in fact, most people, are looking for these waters in the wrong place. The wicked walks with his pride flying high, and all day long his thoughts are vanity. He's thinking up here because that's where he believes that he is. The righteous walk with humility, and all day long his thoughts are where? And the Torah. Now, we are commanded to dwell on them day and night, right? Vagita boy umam valayla. So thinking about the Torah is the opposite of pride? The Torah itself is humility. The Torah itself is the inseparable word of God. And the son of Jesse, King David, knew this, and he knew it well. For where does the rain go, if not from the heavens, to the lowest places on earth? And that is why the wicked cannot even see, because their consciousness is over here. And when I say over here, I don't mean with God. I mean with their own up here. But the righteous dwell on it day and night. And it, my friends, is down here. This is where we're called to be in order to receive this generous gift. Verse 11, we're still in Psalm 68, by the way. Your congregation dwelt therein. You prepare with your goodness for the poor, O God. La'ani Elohim. So who's the poor? One with no money? One with no bread or water? Or one who has all the money in the world, but their hunger can never be satiated, their thirst never be quenched. Are we all familiar with Isaiah 55? 
Oh, all those who thirst, go to water, and whoever has no money, go, buy, and eat. And go, buy without money, and without a price, wine and milk. Why should you weigh out money without bread, and your toil without sa uh, satiety? Satiety, I think that's what it is. Hearken to me, and eat what is good, and your soul shall delight in fatness. Incline your ear, and come to me. Hearken, and your soul shall live. And I will make for you an everlasting covenant and depend, uh, the dependable mercies of David. Behold, a witness to the nations have I appointed him, a ruler and a commander of nations. Behold, a nation you do not know you shall call, and a nation that did not know you shall run to you. For the sake of the Lord your God and for the Holy One of Israel, for he glorified you. Seek the Lord when he is found. Call him when he is near. Right now the Lord can be found, and he is near, and call upon him. People also ask me, what more can I do to get closer to God? You're doing it. The seeking itself, the desire itself to get close to God, that's what it is. You're getting there. Don't stop. The wicked shall give up his way. And the man of the iniquity, his thoughts. And he shall return to the Lord, who shall have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, says the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. For just as the rain and the snow fall from the heavens, and it does not return here unless it has satiated the earth and, fruit, and, fruitified, and fruitified it and furthered its growth and has given seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word, what is God's word? It's his Torah, that emanates from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty unless it has done what I desire and has made prosperous the one whom I sent it. Everything is predestined, and it's all been written. All of life exists based on our choices. The water comes from the heavens. Are you thirsty? How fitting is it that humility and contriteness is the only place that Torah can even exist? It's the highest measure of the Word of God. Look at some of the MVPs. Abraham, Genesis 18, 27. He interceded for the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham answered and said, Behold, now I have commenced to speak to the Lord, although I am dust and ashes. Abraham. The second creation was for Abraham. I'm dust and ashes. I'm nothing. Moses and Aaron. Exodus 16, 7, when the children of Israel were complaining for the lack of meat. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord when he hears your complaints against the Lord. But of what significance are we that you make the people complain against us? Venachanuma, what are we? This is Moses and Aaron. This is your first redeemer and you have your first high priest over there. And the desperate cries of King David in Psalm 22, 7. David Melech Israel. But I am a worm and not a man, a reproach of man, despised by peoples. So, just again, examples. So is Abraham nothing more than dust? Were Moses and Aaron insignificant? Was David a worm? Compared to the master of the universe, Yes, they were, and they knew it. And it is because they knew it that they found themselves in the kingdom of heaven. I'll explain. Malchut Shamaim, that is the kingdom of heaven. Why Malchut Shamaim? I'll tell you. Deuteronomy 30, verse 12. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will go up to heaven for us and fetch it for us, to tell it to us, so that we can fulfill it. This is what Moses is speaking on behalf of God to the people. The Torah is not in heaven. 
It's right here. And trust me, we will discuss this passage in due time. But as of now, it's not there. It's here. God didn't go go through all this creation stuff to make a covenant with Abraham stuff, to forming a nation stuff, to give us his word stuff, only so later a bunch of poor souls would deceive most of humanity into thinking that the law, that the Torah had been done away with. Now I'm just, because I said this, I'm going to complete the next two sentences, the next two verses. Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will cross to the other side of the sea for us and fetch it for us, to tell it to us so that we can fulfill it. Rather, this thing is very close to you. It is in your mouth. It is in your heart so that you can fulfill it. Ki karov elecha hadavar me'od very much beficha ubelavavcha la'asoto. Asoto. Do it, right? Child above, just... Do it! Just do it! Now, in this particular case, I'm not speaking to you, uh, I'm not speaking to my beloved Gentile brothers and sisters, for you are not under the law, but I am speaking to and warning my Jewish brothers and sisters, who are indeed bound by this law and will be judged accordingly. God did not give us the Torah, so we should not fulfill it or even attempt to fulfill it. What are we reading here? All right. Let's get back. Sorry about that. Lo b'shamayim hi. It is not in the heavens. Now, what is the word water in Hebrew? It's maim. Mem yud mem. Okay? Now, what is heavens? Shamayim. We have maim and shamayim. When we say shamayim, it's also in modern day Hebrew, it's a sky. So what is the Hebrew word for there, like over there? Shum. So here we have maim, and there we have shamaim or water over there. Sham maim, water there. Water, water over there. So when God opens the heavens and pours his rain down from the shamaim, from the water over there, pours his rains down upon us, to give life to the world is the same as the dew and the snow that falls from the heaven to fulfill the word of God that will not return void. And when this happens, we are quite literally, spiritually speaking, building the kingdom of heaven, Shamayim, right here on earth, especially when we know where to find this water. And in order for us to even comprehend and take it in, we have to go to the lowest points, not spiritually, of course, but in humility. As written in Isaiah fifty-seven fifteen, For so said the high and exalted one, who dwells to eternity, and his name is holy. With the lofty and the holy ones I dwell, and with the crushed and humble in spirit. Why? to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the crushed. So, that's Mount Sinai. (laughs) Now, who's thirsty? Don't get so. All right. And the Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and you shall say to them, When you come to the land that I am giving you, The land shall rest a Sabbath to the Lord. Now for the first 13 verses in this chapter, God instructs Moses regarding the laws of Shemitah. Every seventh year, you stop, just like every seventh day. You stop. Vishavta ha'aretz Shabbat Ladonai. The land shall rest, a Sabbath to the Lord. On the seventh day of the week, we are to rest, and on the seventh year, we are to allow the land to rest. Now, this is very important because God includes all of His creation over here. He's giving respect to the mountain and to the land. 
like they're alive or something. But that's a thing. They are. Whatever God creates is good. And like I said from the beginning, read this with great humility. I'm trying to give you some perspective here. As a first thing that is mentioned is what would seem to be something insignificant. Okay, you read it from, from the mountain. But what does that mean? God has called this land good. A land flowing with milk and honey. It is his land that he has given to us to be caretakers, not owners. Now again, if you've been to Israel, Israel's a beautiful land. Sure, it's not bad. But, I mean, it really pales in comparison in its physical beauty to some, you know, you got mountains here. Okay, fine, you got some mountains. But if you go to the Swiss Alps or the French Alps or any other kind of Alps, I mean, that's some impressive land and stuff. You understand? There are many more beautiful places in the world. But this is what we can only see in the spirit. Okay? So this is these are the eyes I'm trying to give you here. So, God gave us this land. Like I said, <clears throat> we're the caretakers, not the owners. But for all intents and purposes, it's ours. And what happens when we actually did not keep the laws of the Shemitah? What happened when we did not let the land rest? What happened when we didn't trust God to take care of us while we were not permitted to gather from our crops? It's the same thing, like working on Shabbat. There's no blessing in working on Shabbat. We were expelled from the land for the exact amount of years that we did not keep the laws of Shemitah. Without getting into the breakdown, it was 70 years of Shemitah and Yovel and the Jubilee, which is the 50th. So the Babylonian exile was exactly 70 years. God always makes good on his word. Now, in next week's Parsha, we're not done yet. I'm just saying next week's Parsha in regards to this actually says exactly what would happen. So this is chapter 26, uh, 33 to 35. I'll read it really quick. And I will scatter you among the nations. This is what happens if we do not listen to these particular rules. And I will unsheath the sword after you. Your land will be desolate, right? And your cities will be laid waste. That exactly happened. Then the land will be appeased regarding its sabbaticals. During all the days that it remains desolate, while you are in the land of your enemies, the land will rest and thus appease its sabbaticals. Got to balance things out here. It will rest during all the days that it remains desolate, whatever it had not rested on your sabbaticals when you lived upon it. So what are we taught here? To respect God, his land, and his word. Between man and the place. It's another reference for God. And now, slowly, we begin to see how our relationship with God, his land, and his word are connected to our fellow man. And you shall not wrong one man his fellow. It says, Ish Amito, like comrade. You understand? And you shall fear your God, for I am the Lord your God. This is verse 17 in the Parsha. You see, if we're crooked to our fellow Jews, that means that we don't believe God is good for his word. It shows lack of faith on our part, as well as greed, malice, and deceit. Or in other words, fraud. Are you a fraud? Do you teach the poor and thirsty full false doctrines while attempting to grow your name? Don't you worry now. Have I got the thing for you? That's why God has to remind us that even if we think that no one is looking and we think that we can get away with it, oh, you shall fear your God. That's why it says it right there in the verse. And so again, I have to say, there are snakes and scorpions among us. And they do not fear the Lord your God because your God is not their God. They are their own God. I am. You shall perform my statutes, keep my ordinances, and perform them. Then you will live on the land securely. Verse 18. Now twice it says, you shall do them, because if you don't, see chapter 26, but if you do, and the land will then yield its fruit, and you will eat to Satiety, can't get that word straight, and live upon it 
securely. Now it's true, God always has to remind us of who he is because we forget. But he also has to remind us of who we are. Verse 23, the land shall not be sold permanently for the land, get this, belongs to me, not me, him, me. For you are strangers and temporary residents with me. God is speaking to the Jewish people right now. And he's telling them that the land belongs to me. For you are strangers and temporary residents with me. Let's read these words in Hebrew because it might, you know, spark something for some of you. Ki gerim v'toshavim atem imadi. Gerim, toshavim, ger, ger toshav. Yeah, okay. You can sublet. Your name is on the deed. But the God is the landlord. And that's why if we disrespect the land, the Torah, our bodies, our fellow Jew, our fellow man, we essentially disrespect God himself. The wording that is used in Hebrew here, ki gerim v'toshavim atem imadi, a ger is someone who connects themselves with Israel. Okay, once you become a ger tzedek, that's a person, well, gerim are Gentiles, right? Once you become a ger tzedek, you become a Jew. You are no longer a ger nothing, you're a Jew. So, um, uh, the gerim are people who attach themselves to Israel, they become Jews, and through the people, that ger becomes a, uh, becomes a Jew. They have exactly the same status as a Jew. Then there's a ger toshav, a resident, a Gentile who dwells in the borders of Israel, but is not bound by the law. Now here God is saying gerim vetoshavim, gerim and residents. Now why is God saying this? I believe that he is showing us that the Gentiles who enter into Israel, to you, are like Israel who enter into me. You understand? That's why he always reminds us that we used to be gerim. The same reason why we go through trials. We think it's about us. Now listen up, people. We think it's about us, but perhaps for our personal growth, we should choose to learn from these painful experiences. But the real reason we go through these trials are for the benefit of the next person. So what do I mean? How can you empathize with someone in need if you weren't there yourself? How can you truly help and understand someone, to the best of our ability, of course, if we cannot connect on some core issues. God made Israel, Gerim, so that we would know exactly what it feels like to be strangers, not in our own land. So when the time comes, and all the nations of the world come to the Jew, So said the Lord of hosts in those days when 10 men of all tongues of the nations shall take a hold of the corner of a Jewish, of the corner of the garment of Jewish man saying, let us go with you for we have heard that God is with you. Zechariah 8.23, we cannot send these people away. Our neshama is the same. It's like sending another Jew away if you're doing that. Even though they're technically, on paper, not Jews yet, if they have a desire to be a Jew and they do everything, they're like, I don't care if it takes me two years, three years, 20 years, 100 years. My people are your people. I will die where you die. It doesn't matter. That person is already a Jew before God. Now you got to go through the technicalities. Welcome to the Mishpacha. Mazel tov. Israel, this is your land in the real. You are the warden. Not of the north, just the warden. I give it to you. All those who seek to enter, should they be true, walking according to my statutes and command, you will accept them and call them brother. You will love them. You will guide them and teach them my ways. For I am the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Verse 24. Therefore, throughout the land of your possession, you shall give redemption for the land. Uvechol eretz achuzatchem, achuzat is your estate, also leechoz, to grasp that you will take hold of. Geula titnu laaretz. Geula, so redemption. Now the language here is incredible. When we think of redemption, what do we think of? Redemption, the Redeemer, what are you thinking of right now? God, tshuva, Mashiach, peace, Third temple, the world to come, right? All of the above. Here God is telling Israel, 
that I will redeem you, but you will redeem the land. Now, this is part of tikkun olam, the rectification of the world, redeeming of the world. All of existence must and will be redeemed. Now, this is where it begins, right here. But now look at what God does in order to strengthen our bonds with him, the land, and each other. If your brother becomes destitute and sells some of his inherited property, his Redeemer, who is related to him, shall come forth and redeem his brother's sale. who is near to him, We are being told. We're, to- we're being told this because our brother will indeed become poor. It's not if, it's when. It's an absolute. Now this is by design, both for our benefit, of being able to fulfill the command of giving and helping our brother, and for the benefit of our brother who is poor. How does it benefit the poor to be poor? Great question. Tzadikim suffer in order to elevate the people. Sadiq Yesod Olam, I might have discussed this before. The righteous are the foundation of the earth. This Sadiq must suffer so that Israel can be elevated through giving. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them whenever you want, right? And the thing is, today it's me, tomorrow it's you. Now, even though in the Pshat, in the simple text, it's written regarding the laws of the land, that we're speaking of the Torah right here. And so even when our brother is in a spiritual funk, it is God who gives to us for the reason that we give to them. There are poor people, and then there are wealthier people. God gave, God just just as easily could have given the poor person Some of the rich person's money, which obviously is all God's money, but you you understand what I'm saying. But God gave this poor person, God made this person poor. In other words, they have to suffer so that everyone else has the opportunity to give because the extra that God gave to those is basically to fulfill the mitzvah of giving to them. You understand how it works? It's perfect. Your money's not yours. Your land is not yours. Even your life is not yours. But our life is most important. That's why he gives up his life, you know, for his friends. Because we are all connected with one another. What is good for you is good for me and vice versa. Verse 26. And if a man does not have a redeemer, but he gains enough means to afford its redemption, he shall calculate the years for which the land has been sold and return the remainder to the man whom he sold it, and then he may return his inherit, uh, to his inheritance. But if he cannot afford enough to repay him, his sale shall remain in the possession of the one who has purchased it until the Jubilee year. Ad shnata yovel. And then in the Jubilee year, it shall go out and revert to his inheritance. And his Redeemer came. This is the relationship between God and Israel. We are called to be dependent upon God and give the same courtesy to our brothers just as we get it from God. We are called to calculate the years of sale because our entire life is a bunch of checks and balances. And in the end, everything gets paid in full. The debtors pay their debts whether they like it or not. 35. If your brother becomes destitute and his hand falter beside you, brothers falling beside you, you shall support him, whether a convert or a resident, doesn't matter. Anybody that's in your space is your brother, so that he can live with you. You shall not take from him interest or increase, and you shall fear your God and let your brother live with you. You understand? You shall not give him your money with interest, nor shall you give your food with an increase. I don't know how else to say this. It's, 
It's pretty clear. Bottom line is, don't be an ass. And should you forget, because you most likely will every now and again, especially when you find yourself in a tough spot, verse 38, I am the Lord your God who took you out of the land of Egypt. Yeah, remember what I did for you? It's payback time. To give you the land of Canaan to be a God to you. Now you go tell these people who I am and why you're being so good to them. The only way they could know me is through you. This is what it is. This is how it works. Now again, I take you out of Canaan to bring you into Egypt, to take you out of Egypt in order to bring you into Israel so you can ultimately provide a safe haven for the nations who enter. You shall not enslave them, for you are slaves. You shall not mistreat them, for you are mistreated. But you shall love them as I love you, and you shall accept them as I accept you. Come on, Bubula. Bring it in. You know you want it. Come on. All right. Okay. Now here's an interesting one. Verse 47. If a resident non-Jew gains wealth with you, and your brothers become and your brother becomes destitute with him, and is sold to a resident non-Jew among you, or to an idol of the family of a non-Jew. Now the translation is uh, specific in its description of the ger in this verse. The English is just from the Chabad website. Again, I read the Hebrew. Um, so the Chabad website, they're pretty good, but they may use Jewish terms to translate the Hebrew, which most people without a Jewish background or upbringing might misunderstand because it doesn't actually say Jew, okay? Or non-Jew. It says gerim in that specific context. Uh, context. So again, that's the version that's translated. Le'eker mishpachat ger. This is what it says. To an idol of the family of a non-Jew. So what does this mean? The Hebrew eker or akar means futile. While adding the letter he, it turns it into akara, a barren woman. Or if he's akar, that means the dude is unable to make babies. Anyway, according to the Midrash, the akar from this verse refers to Rome, because Rome in the future, God will turn into an akara, barren, not producing any fruit. Because in this Parsha, there are hints that Israel will be enslaved to the non-Jews, the four exiles. The ger from this verse is Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. The toshav is the Persian Empire. And sold to the Ger Toshav amongst you is Greece. And the Eker of the fam of the Ger and the family, of the Ger family, excuse me, is Rome. But also there is a hint that Shuva will bring our Redeemer. Now in the meantime, we act as the Redeemer to one another. I'm your Redeemer, you're my Redeemer. See that? Or the way I like to look at it is that God is in fact redeeming us through each other. It's very simple. Until the day and the hour of the final redemption. Verse 48. After he is sold, he shall have redemption. After he is sold, gone, came back, he shall have redemption. One of his brothers shall redeem him. Now listen up. This brother, according to our sages, is none other than Mashiach ben David. And this is what they say. <clears throat> For he is from the tribe of Judah, which is, a, which is special of all the tribes. And one of its tribesmen will be the Messiah, as in quite literally one of your brothers, someone who you know. He is the Redeemer who is flesh and blood like the rest of his brothers. He is born to a father and mother like the rest of his brothers. And he will be like Moses who served as the first Redeemer, only he will be the last Redeemer. Maybe that's who Moses was talking about. God will raise a prophet from one of you. Listen to him, like me. This redemption through repentance is likened to silver. Because just like pure silver is pure and shiny white, so does the process of tshuva purify the nefesh and whitens the sins. 
God is going to close all the accounts. In Hebrew, lizgol cheshbon. Sometimes, you know, let's say if, you, if you're at a restaurant, you're like, you know, check please, temotim lizgol cheshbon. You, wanna, you want the check? Sure. It literally means close the accounts. But when you say to somebody, ani olech lizgol itcha cheshbon, that means I got some, we got unfinished business and it's about to be taken care of. So it's got a thing. So when God closes the accounts with all the nations who messed with his kids, even just a little bit, <coughs> this is going to happen on Shnat Yovel, the, uh, the year of Jubilee, which is called the year of freedom. So what Chazal are saying here is that there's a very specific time that Mashiach ben David will come and with him the final redemption. However, it is within our power and will to make this day come sooner. Verse 54. And if he is not redeemed through any of these ways, meaning tshuva, he shall go out in the, in the jubilee year and his children with him. So, in other words, it's going to happen then. So, high on the clouds or lowly on the donkey? Maybe both. 55. For the children of Israel are servants to me. They are my servants, whom I took out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord, your God. It's God reminding the nations of the hierarchy of how things work. He's reminding Israel of who they are. Nations, if you want in, you are most certainly welcome to come in, but respect the word and respect the process. Jews, Respect yourselves, man. Come on. Know who you are and who the true Godfather is. If you disrespect who you are, you are disrespecting your master, for we are but his servants. There are people who demand respect and those who command respect. You know the difference? See, those who demand respect, they never get it. Okay, those are the ones who yell and belittle and love throwing around their authority. We've met these kind of people before, haven't we? Those are people that you really need to stay away from. Nothing good comes from there. But there are those who command respect and don't mess with them in a bad way. Because when they hit you, you'll never see it coming. So my friends, let's close with this. Respect God. His word, the process, the Jew, respect the Gentile, respect yourself. If you respect me, then I will respect you. Leave here today with one thing that you should know. We will be refined like fine silver, and our sins be white as snow. Thank you so much for joining me. I'll see you all next week. Have a Shabbat Shalom.